Boys and girls, welcome to another episode of the Lions Den Leadership Podcast. Steve, do I have it right? You got it right. Good job. Yeah, it's like seven episodes in, and I still don't know what we're called. But I know what we do, and we inspire entrepreneurs, owners of companies, folks who are just starting a business to think a little bit differently, to elevate from day to day operations, think big, strategize, and know that people like Steve and I and Mike here today are. You know, just the same kind of people dealing with the same kind of challenges. We're seeing some success. We're failing a lot. This is the life of an entrepreneur, and we want to help you live it. How is that, Steve? I think that's a good thing. I heard a, I heard a, uh, I heard a line the other day, and it said, "The road to success is always under construction." <laughs> I thought that was an interesting way to put it. Right? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So I just kind of, kind of start us off, like if you. Um, boys and girls are listening right now. Uh, you're like, what is this going to be about? Well, we're going to make it about growth through acquisitions. We have like probably one of the most ex, uh, experienced property managers. Well, no, owner of the property management companies who has done a lot of those acquisitions to talk through this with us. It's Mike Catalano. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. It's going to be great. Yeah, awesome. So you, we spent, you and I spent a couple episodes on the property management show, my podcast I run, go through this. Um, I think you and I had the very first yeah. uh, you know, radio show or podcast show about acquisitions, and it was back in 15, 2015. Yeah, a lot, a lot has changed and a lot hasn't. And you know, it's funny <laughs> is when I was doing, when I started doing some research on acquisitions, that show was the number one uh, search that came up uh, on Google. When I started doing a Google search on, on acquisitions and buying property management companies. So Gosh, I should go back and listen to it. <laughs> and we should say this is, this is how the world works. So what happened is, this is why Steve is sitting next to Mike. Here's what happened. Steve found this. Talk to me about it. You know, I said, hey, you should get to know Mike. He said, I really want to get to know Mike. And I'm thinking about acquisitions now. This is something in my, you know, viewfinder. And I want to explore more. And so who, you know, let's, you know, let's find an expert. And so Steve flew all the way from Houston, although he's a pilot, so it's not that difficult. But you flew from Houston <laughs> to San Jose, you know, met up with Mike. And after we're done with this podcast, I'm going to cruise on over there and we're going to have a little car race and then a dinner <laughs> <laughs> and talk a lot about EOS, which is, which has got me all excited these days. But right now we're talking about acquisitions. Steve, why don't you kick us off? This is one thing I wanted to understand, and maybe from your perspective. You're a successful company, man. You, you're growing fast organically. You're multiplying in different locations. You really think this through and you execute well. Why all of a sudden you are interested in acquiring new companies, other property management companies? Isn't that a headache? Um, well, you know, there, it, it's, I don't know if it's the grass is greener theory, but I don't think it's an or, I think it's an and. And I think that when you're looking to grow, you've got to look at all the avenues that you can take. And I don't think, you know, as we're looking to grow through acquisitions, and, and we are getting very serious about that uh, business model and that strategy, I should say, I don't think it's, it's not that we're going, to can, we're going to not do our rollout model, which is organic growth, because in our marketing, we're bringing in about 200 leads a month coming in. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. You have other challenges with regular marketing, you know. Um, you know, we rolled into a new city, and it's about, you know, nine, about 10 months or so, and, and we're not at where we would like to be, where we forecasted our growth to be. Um, our dip in finances was a little lower because one thing that we realize is when you're going into a new city is – you've got to get that momentum wheel turning. It's like getting that locomotive train pushing down the track. It takes a lot of energy and that energy is money. And so we thought about that. We thought, you know, our dip was more than we thought to, to go into the new city. And we thought if we just acquired a company, we'd have more doors or, or the same amount of doors right now, but they'd be instant. You'll have the momentum too, right behind it. The momentum would start because we're still doing the back end stuff, but, but that back end stuff is not, you know, in, in, you know, in our main, HQ area of Houston, you know, that wheel is turning, that momentum wheel is spinning. You go into a new city, you're starting from scratch. Nobody knows you, nobody cares about you, your SEO, all that stuff, that all starts from scratch. So um, it, it's a very viable and it's not an or, in my opinion. Got it. And Mike, Mike, you've done a number of those things. Can you sort of extrapolate for us, people who have never done it, or people maybe who's just on the fence about this? Why is it so why is it so opportunistic and why do you do it? Why do you bother with, you know, acquiring companies and going through the whole process and integration, all that? 
No, it's well, first off, like we talked about, it's it's quick growth, right? It's the fastest way to enter another market without having to, like we talked about, start one at a time. Um, I enjoy doing it, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so that, that's been kind of re rejuvenated me in the industry. It's been, I mean, I don't want to say it's, it's super fun, but it's a fun thing for me to do. Um, you can get doors quickly, you can enter a market, and you can grow more quickly. If you buy a company that is well known in the industry, you can have if you buy their website, you get their back end, you, your marketing will come more quickly in that area. Um, but it is, I agree, it is, it is an and, because we also do all the marketing for all those companies as well. So we have as much marketing, and of course, you know, Alex knows four and a half does all our marketing. Um, it's a must that you do that because you have a normal attrition of a company where you're gonna lose people that, you know, go to sell, you know, go to move back in, especially in Silicon Valley, we have people going in and out of this area for on contracts overseas and coming back. So you lose those, so you have to do the marketing to keep that steady, uh, but the acquisition growth is much more quickly. So you can get 100 doors or 200 doors or more at one time. And you know, Alex, one thing I was thinking about, or I've thought about quite a bit is, if you look at the airline industry, so let's say an airline wants to grow a market share into a new territory. They can go and they can start doing routes, right? But they've gotta, they've gotta build that route up, right? So for example, I do the Houston to Sydney, Australia route, okay? That route is very thin right now, meaning they don't have a lot of people on that route, but they're, they say, we ask them, we say, man, we're only taking like 90, 100 people. It's a 300 person airplane. It, you know, it can't be very productive. They right. say, you know what? It's right on track for what we expect it to be. But let's say we go ahead and, and you know, the company I work for goes ahead and buys another airline that does the Australian market. Now they just injected a lot of growth. So, you know, for example, here in California, when I grew up, American Airlines bought Air Cal they wanted a presence on the West Coast. Instead of them having to establish themselves, they just bought a company. They got the planes, they got the equipment, they got the staffing, they got everything with signing a document without the blood, sweat, and tears of the momentum growth. So there's something to be said, and that's how all come, you know, there's a lot of acquisitions that happen that way. So I, I know you say that there's a lot of headache, and yes, there are, but I think the positive, if you have it structured correctly, like I'm here to learn from this guy, is that the, the positive is, is that if you have it structured correctly on the back end without grinding too many gears, it, it, it will exponentially grow your company. Now, if you are someone that does not want to grow that fast, or maybe, um, I'm assuming if maybe your systems are not as solid and your procedures are not intact and you don't have a strategy for the integration side, I'm guessing that would be something that would probably, you know, as they say in flying, it'll take you to the crash site quicker. Um, it could implode your company quicker. Um, but I, I think it's one of those things that that's how you capture that market share. But I think, I think it's one of those things that you have to be very procedural on the back end. I'm, I'm assuming to be able to integrate that company at some level, you let it, I'm guessing you let it run on its own, right? I mean, for a little while. Yeah. So there's an integration, but before we go there, I actually want to sort of take a kind of a life cycle approach to this, how to find it, right? How to evaluate it and then how to, you know, purchase it, close and integrate. So if you don't mind next 30 minutes, let's follow that. If that's okay. Take the reins, Alex. Okay. Go for it. Go for it. Well, there's one qualifier I wanted to identify, and I think I see it throughout all the successful companies that acquire others and do really, really well with it is operationalized marketing and operationalized sales. Now sales, is, but marketing, and those are both essential things. So, so Steve, you run a company, you have marketing department, you've invested in four and a half while back, you know, you've learned what you need to learn, but you, you sort of, your company grows so fast, you needed your own internal uh, marketing talents, and now these guys are working for you, and there's more than one in that department. Mike, you brought in four and a half to do everything, all of your marketing, so you don't have to, it's, it's a who, not what for you. In other words, like not what we do, but who can do it for me, and who can do it better um, than anything, anyone else I can do, and, and then I hire that person and I integrate it. So those two pieces need to, sales and marketing need to be in place, I think, to really have a, a big win, right, with an acquisition, right? Before you consider buying, would you say, both of you guys, would you say, or Mike, maybe specifically, would you say that's as a true statement or it's not necessary? So it's important, but when you're buying another company, the, as you know, the last two that I did, we didn't bring you guys in right away because really I need to know that the operations are set up, making sure everyone's running properly. I'm really concentrating on the integration of what I want to do, whether it's changing things or not changing things, getting things set up for, the, for that. So you need to really be set up operational uh, side of things so you can get that going. And then 
I'll be honest, secondarily, I started doing the marketing, but I want to make sure it's set up. I don't bombard these new employees if I keep them on board with all these new clients coming in when we're not ready to, we're not understanding. Really good point. So you're saying establish scale first, understand the scalability of that location, that organization, that, that unit before you pipe the marketing. But if you didn't have the marketing, right, that the longer vision I think is, is integrating and, and giving them um, the winning strategies and, and executing those strategies against this new company for it to really grow. And the thing is, I know what you guys right? do because we're already doing it for one of the companies. So it's just a waiting game. It's for me to say, okay, when are we ready to basically let you guys loose? Like a right? plug and play. Yeah, pretty much say, okay, Al, this is what happened with the last two, the one partner sites we just did for the two companies that are out of my general area. We got it all set up. And then I said, Alex, here it is. Here's, give it to your team. Let's go. Now, you know, one thing, and, and, you know, we haven't done this, obviously, but some of the things that I've heard and learned and, and, and talked to about is um, a lot of times I would imagine that when you're looking at a company, I was told there's basically four variables and I, and I can't think of them what they are, but it's like, you know, sales, marketing, operations. You look at the pillars of a company right. and you say, okay, are, you know, there, there's, I'm sure there's going to be deficiencies somewhere in these companies because maybe they've been neglected maybe they're people that are retiring whatever the case may be and if if you have one or two you keep moving if there's three no go four definitely no go or, or i think three may be a deep discount on the pricing so if there's three of those pillars that have problems so you, i think you pick that apart and maybe you look when you're i'm assuming when you're looking at these companies you know what i would look at first was like mike said first of all operationally it's got to have that structure to be able to stand on its own. I don't know if marketing and sales would be the first thing I would look at. I think I would assume they're probably not uh, sales and marketing centric, which is okay because we are. I would be looking at how are they structurally sound and can they keep functioning for the next maybe nine months, 10 months. Yeah. Well, so steady. And the thing that I was talking about is like, I need to be structurally sound, right? Before I do acquisitions. And it doesn't mean I'm going to push my structure on them immediately. Um, some of them, every company, that's the thing, is every single company I've ever purchased runs differently. And if I came in there and slammed them with what I want to do right away, you have more attrition. And that's what I've learned over the years, is that if I try and push my structure immediately, you're going to lose clients. So what I do is I look what they, look what they do, how they do it, and I really study that over time. And then we get that going. Once we have that part settled, I slowly integrate some of my ideas of what I want to do and we get the marketing going. But the other thing you have to know is that a lot of these companies, I've purchased some and I learn from their operations as well. I'm not perfect here. We're not doing everything we need to do. There's things that we can learn. And I've seen, you know, ancillary fees that I never even heard of on some of these companies that I've purchased, which I've implemented on my other companies. So not only did I buy a company, I also increased the value of my company by the other companies that I own by ultimately getting those fees. You can learn from them as well. So all of that in one. 100%. By the way, we call them value-add services, Mike. This is well, ancillary fees. is so 2017. You learn how to pronounce ancillary, so I'm going to use that. <laughs> That's a big <laughs> word, by the way. It is a big word, man. What the heck? So let me ask you another question, Mike. So we were still in the valuation process. By the way, I want to answer the question, what's my company worth? Because um, even on my company, like I'm, I have all the chats. I don't know, Steve, if you get all the, all the chats, people that ask you questions on chat on your website. I get every single one transcript. I read them all. I just want to kind of stay the pulse of the market and what, what people are asking for. I'll tell you once a week, people come up to my website, my marketing website, and ask me, hey, what is my company could be worth? How much can I sell my company for? How do I put, how do I price my company? How do I value? I'm looking to purchase a company. How do I know they're, like all these questions come up. So I want to get that question answered, but put a pin on that for a second. Here's the one I want to know. This is the one I get asked for help, but not often enough. How do you evaluate the brand value, Mike? Well, I mean, you look at multiple things. You look at how new their website is. You look at their reputation online. You look at um, how long they've been in business. So all of those things come into consideration when you're purchasing a company. If I'm purchasing someone that's been around in an area for 25 years and their website's been percolating for 20 years, I can really work on the SEO. That's going to be more valuable to me. There's not an actual number on it. Well, that's the, that's, the, that's the thing. So there's no quantifiable, there's no quantifiable way for you to evaluate what that brand is worth. Because if you're going up against 
another property management company, usually it's a multiple bid situation, right? Nobody sells to one person. Well, sometimes they do, but most times they'll have multiple bids. So you don't go in there right now with a clear understanding what that brand is worth because the website could be old and crusty, but they see SEO value of that website could be phenomenal. And even if you rebrand, if you sunset that brand over time and build your own, Steve, that's, I think that's what you want to do, right? You're going to, you want to have an empire, right? Eventually. Yeah. But you can actually, change. this is going to, sorry to interrupt, but this is going to change moving forward in the valuations because the industry is learning matrix, right? They're learning the value of per door. They're learning how many leads they get per month. We're going to, I'll be able to put a number on that more as we go further because people are tracking it more in this industry than they ever have. Yeah. yeah and that's interesting. People call me and ask me this and I actually enjoy the process. Remember you said something like, Hey, you know, you, you enjoy the process of, um, buying companies. Well, I really enjoy the process of putting a value on a brand because there's actually a structure approach to it. You know, you go from the bottom up, right? And you, you figure out what the cost dollar per contract is, lifetime customer value, what the profitability potentially could be. And then you apply it against the brand and all the assets of the brand. And there's actually not that difficult if you know all the components. And so, Steve, have you thought about this value, this, this valuation? Like, how are yeah. you going to approach this in so, your acquisition? You know, some of the things that, and this, this starts differentiating the, the smaller, we'll call them mom and pop, to, to the operational larger uh, entities. You know, when you start asking the questions of, okay, well, w first, we could start with the basics of where, where do you sit on SEO? Where are you on Google? Okay. Then you see that. Then I would start going, okay, what is your acquisition cost per strategy, per client? And then, okay, what are the different marketing strategies you're doing? And are they, are, how many funnels do you have coming in? So like Mike said, if they don't even have a website and they don't have any strategies to bring inbounds and they say, we just use, you know, one of the pay per click, like the all property management. Well, that's not a strategy. So to me, if, if they stop doing that, then, you know, they're they don't, they're, there's no value in that strategy. So I think that that would come into valuating the company, meaning are they, bringing in business on their own on the marketing and sales side. And to me, that would affect the price point of the company. You know, not saying it's good or bad, but it's definitely a variable that I think you have to look at because if they say, hey, you know, for example, we, we bring in 200 leads a month. If somebody asks us, hey, what's your lead for strategy? And we say we're at $450, door, $450 per acquisition. And I think we're, I don't know, we're, we're very low. I think we're at $92 per lead. We know, we know our numbers, we know our strategies. You're going to look at that and go, well, shit, these guys got their stuff together. They must, they must know their numbers. You know what I mean? It, it starts checking. I do. Out but the there's, another, there's another side to this so that you are operating on the sunny side, right? And your sunny side, implementing EOS, entrepreneur operating system, you have a scorecard. Anybody comes to your office, be like, hey, Steve, what's your CAC? For, you know, September 28th, 2018, you'd be like, okay, no problem. It was $460. It's $10 below average, right? You are able to communicate that way. Let's go on a shady side where it's a little bit of the, you know, not shady meaning like it's, it's, it's unethical, but, but shaded, right? Uh, different, different shades of gray because people just don't track these things. Sure. So here's the delta. The big delta is you evaluate for the, the advice says don't evaluate for opportunity, the current opportunity, I evaluate for the future opportunity. Because look, if that website, it has, has a lot of domain authority and links go into it, let's just, I'm just giving you examples, right? And there's other factors that make the website, like the headings and titles that make the website tank in rankings, right? You can turn around in literally like a couple of months. You can go number one on Google and like nobody knew where you came from, right? You could do that, but you also, this is another side of it, if that website is sandboxed, let's say it looks really good from the back end, right? When you've done your analysis, but it, you didn't know it's sandboxed by Google for, for, for shady stuff, for shady practices, black hat SEO, what have you. Now you just paid, overpaid for something that you'll never be able to recover. So there's, there's this two aspects of things that, but I think so future value, I think is, it needs to be considered against current value as well. And nobody, Steve, nobody will have numbers that you do. Just prepare for that. Like right? that. And that's, and that, and you know, that's fine. It just, it helps us streamline our business better. Cause then we can, we know what's working, what's not working, obviously. I mean, um, but I mean, do you ever look at that valuation when you're, well, as far as I'm, out of the last four that I did, they didn't have any of that information. Right. I, so, yeah. but you can, like I said, you can really see how they are operationally. You can see how their, their reputation is online. If they're answering bad reviews, if they're active on there, you know that they're going to have some sort of marketing that's working. Um, 
but it, it's a tough one to really see. And I really just kind of look at the numbers uh, of what they are. And, you know, I come up with my own evaluation of what I think makes sense. And, you know, what I would say is if you have a company that's established, it, you know, a strategy could be, you know, we're just going to put powered by Empire. So when I buy his company, uh, you know, we're just going to better start saving now, brother. Hey, what we set up. That's everybody right. can, everyone has a price, right? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, you could just put your name underneath it, leave everything as is for a while. And then, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, I go back to the airlines. We just did a big merger, you know, United Airlines and Continental. For the big, for the most time, nothing changed. They may have changed the name, but nothing changed on, they were running different systems, different everything. And they, you know, it's been eight years and they're still integrating that change. So I don't think you need to make that shift as quick as possible. Um, that, that most people think you need to do that. That's my opinion, but I, you know, that, that's where I'm going with that. Absolutely true. Well, the proper way to sort of sunset the brand is the strategy that again, I advise to my clients is, you know, you do nothing for a little while, then you would do powered by, or, uh, you know, an empire, empire LLC company or something like that. And then eventually within that's probably 12 to 18 months, you transition into your own brand. It could be, you know, the next step is empire industries, Let's, let's call it Portland. Empire Industries Portland, you know, uh, used to be, or uh, what do you call it? Um, formerly known as. Yeah, uh, formerly known uh, as. <laughs> and and that's, look, it's, that's a possibility, but there's also a possibility that you don't. You don't? Yeah, yeah you don't have to. Absolutely. So you really you have, have to a bad look at name, what makes yeah. sense, right? Because the last two that I did, I didn't change the name. They've been in business too long there. I mean, putting my company in there in different areas that nobody knows yeah. isn't going to help me. Right. So, there, there's, so that's a really, really good point to consider. Right. But let me ask you this. So when you do that, it's a location business. Go ahead. So when you do that, is it all do you keep the LLC under the same? And it's just so we're in California, we can't be under an LLC. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so all other whole we have way country more regulations. Up, here. The country of. But uh, no, so it's under so the last two are under the same corporation, they're DBAs. Okay. And for the Department of Real Estate, is that the name of it now? I'm not sure because it was Bureau of Real Estate last week, Department of Real Estate this week. Uh, they keep changing the name. But anyway, so we have to have a broker's license and then have a corporate license as well that runs with it. Um, and they're all in California, so there's nothing to change as far as that goes for me. But I've run them under the same corporation. I can run separate P&Ls. I can see what they're doing separately so I know exactly what's happening with them, how they're growing, how many properties we're getting per month as new, new clients, how many we're losing per month, and what's happening as far as what each individual office is doing. But I kept the name because they've been there for years. Yeah. And but like I said, putting my company name in the Sacramento area or Santa Cruz or wherever it may be wouldn't have helped me because nobody knows me. Yeah. Right. Brand and recognition. That's, that's why it, it's, it's done over time. But, but I got you. That's a great strategy, 100%. I want to get to a question of what's my company is worth. People right now sitting on the edge of their seats like, hey, what's my company's worth? Let's give out some numbers. Let's throw out some numbers, Mike. Don't be, don't be, don't be stingy. Throw no, some you, numbers out. Look. I have the most boring, boring answer for you of all time. It's okay. worth what you're willing to pay. <laughs> just what, people what is it again? Sorry, I interrupted. Worth what you're willing to pay worth what you're as willing a buyer, to. right? Because you have to evaluate what makes sense for you. Now, if you're selling it, and I'll just kind of give you a norm that I'm hearing in the industry and then what I've seen, and we try and break it down as simple as possible by you know, monthly revenue, uh, gross revenue, and, and, and 12 months, is kind of seem like a standard of late. Um, I've preached really strongly, and I'm the one buying them, which is gonna hurt me in the long run, that that is low. And that's why I'm willing to buy these right now, because I would pay more than that. Once again, shooting myself in the foot for future acquisitions, but I just think they're worth more, and if I pay a little more, it's not hurting. Me. But that's kind of been like this, the standard, what we're looking at. They can be anywhere from eight to 18, you know, or one so to one eight, and a half. To, let's interpret this for people who may not be like really speak the language. It's eight to 18 times monthly management fees. Monthly gross. Monthly, monthly gross. Yeah, what does that mean? Can you, can you? So it could be management if you want to look at that first, but because the industry has changed so much with all the other added value fees, or is that uh, value add? Thank you, Mike. Value add, sorry. Ancillary, whatever you want to call them. There's so much more of that now, and they're so consistent. You have to take that into consideration. I have to, because it's automatic. And of course, we've had late fees that we used to, that have been pretty norm through the industry many years. Um, you know, leasing fees, you know, tenant placement. Those are pretty normal. But now there's so many more tenant fees out there, and there's there's recurring fees that you have to take into consideration. Yeah. So because of that, I take the whole thing, 
if I don't see something consistent or if I see that it's not very consistent, I'll take that out. Um, you know, real estate sales is one that sometimes people want to consider as well. Is that, what's that worth? And I want to see three years. If you could show me three years of consistency for any of these fees, I will consider it as part of the valuation. Understood. Um, but it's A to 18 X your top line, essentially. Yeah. Top line recurring revenue. Yeah. Recurring. And it has to, I need a sample size of this. I, I like to see two to three years, three years. I would really like to see and, and see that they're consistent and I stay with it. I think the companies that go for, for the lower end of this spectrum are the companies who don't have their stuff organized. Like well, you're, my, just, you're taking a gamble. Think, it's a risk price then. Well, what's happening in the industry now is there is a, there's a generation right now that is getting close to getting out of the business. Right. And that's, I think you see some lower valuations with them because they have made their money. They've had the company for a while and they just are ready for an exit. Right. Then you have a different company that's kind of newer generation. That's, operationally really strong you know they're really strong on the marketing side and they're deciding hey this is time to exit and make some money and those might have a little bit higher valuation but it's it's a mixed bag of chips you, you see difference differences all over the board I, I talk to people all over the country about their act what they're trying to do whether they're trying to buy or sell I talk to a lot of people they ask me about it it's all over the map and it really depends on what the the seller wants to do and what the buyer wants to do and they say the average age is 58 years old of the property manager or really? property manager owner, 58. So mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's not quite baby boomer, but it's, yeah, it's getting, close, it's yeah. creeping up in that age bracket. So, you know, you can do a search in your area and, and probably, you know, find some that you can do acquisitions on or like me, go into a new city and start looking for companies that you want to just, you know, acquire to increase the, uh, the, the speed of uh, growth. So let's talk about deal flow, right? Uh, it's all about deal flow because, Mike, you told me this once that out of 10 companies you look at, you buy one. Is that kind of the ratio or is it five, five, one? It's pretty close. It's pretty close, you know? And, and the one thing I've always told people that have ever asked me is, if, you know, if it doesn't fit, don't force it, right? And, you know, at one of the PM Grow um, conferences, Jock McNeil and I uh, spoke. And we did some top 10 pitfalls and top 10 successes. And when we did that, we came up with those 10. And then we went separately and we said, let's number these one through 10. What is the most important? What is the least important out of the 10? And our number ones were the same. We were all over the board on the other ones, but number ones were the same. And one of the number one pitfalls is to acquire just to acquire, right? And if you're just going to buy to buy, you know, you're going to run into problems and you're going to run into issues of, you know, uh, the buyer and seller not being aligned you know, getting too big too fast, you know, there's a lot of things that you can run into. So I'm careful with what we do when mm. we're purchasing. So having said that, then Steve, you all understand the math, right? To buy one company, Steve, how many leads do you need? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, if, if you right? Minimum. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe more. If you're looking at 10, that doesn't mean all those leads are good. You may need 50. Right. And then you look at 10 and then you, you buy one. So, right. yeah, and I'm not looking at 10 a month, right? So it's not, it's, that's not happening. Understood. But, but what is the deal? How, how do you make the deal flow happen, Mike? And uh, so I'm just, I'll interject with my little bit of uh, uh, knowledge. And then you, you guys kind of let me know what your strategy is. Because I talked to Benton Cotter with RentVest, uh, my last podcast. And he's, he's, he's done his through cold calls. Yeah. So what, what are your strategies? Yeah, it's interesting. So we were just talking about that before we got on is that I'm, kind of getting back into looking for some more and I'm going to make cold calls. I am going to do that. That's, that's a good way to do it. Uh, you're going to get shot down a lot. You know how it is. Any salesperson who's done cold calls over the years, he knows they're, they're a tough, tough sell, but you know, speaking at events, letting people know that you do this. And I've talked we talked about this one as well. One of my first acquisitions, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago came from a B and I group. And I just mentioned it to the group that I wanted to do acquisitions. And I felt funny doing it because you come off of arrogant when you're looking to buy companies, but it came from a bank, right? So I'm like, wow, banks are somebody who hold trust accounts. And maybe that's someone you can talk to who knows that someone's selling. So I talk to banks. I talk, speak a little bit here and there, you know, PM Grow or NARPM, broker owner, uh, let your colleagues know, maybe go to your local chapter of NARPM. Those type of things are how you really find out and let people know really you have to let people know you're looking to buy. Otherwise, nobody's ever going to come to you. Gotcha. And I would say that, you know, 
and I haven't started this, this campaign yet, um, but I will be doing shortly, uh, you know, the social media, you know, being, being online on social media, <clears throat> it's that double-edged sword, I think. It's so easy to get online and to be out there, um, but you got to be careful, obviously, who you're talking to and the messages you're conveying. But, I mean, think about all the people on, on these, in these Facebook groups and social media and all, you know, those are, those are the people, though, right? I mean, yeah. essentially, those are the targets that you're looking to acquire. And when I say target, a lot of those people want to be bought. If they're 58 years old, 59 years old or something, they may be going, you know what, I'm kind of done. I, you know, and, and maybe, they want, maybe they want something to be, you know, acquired so they can ride out. And then maybe they're tired of, you know, headaches or stress or frustration or, you know, they're not into technology. They don't want to deal with the new transition uh, of it. So I think using social media is a huge benefit. Yeah, so it I'm, watch you. Uh, go ahead, Mike. I'm terrible at that because I'm very private and I don't go on to social media much. Uh, although with the new user groups and stuff on Facebook, I've been watching there and, and learning lots of things there and poking in and, and commenting here and there. But I think, you know, one of the next steps that I'll probably be doing is put together an ebook on acquisitions of, mm. of the stories that I've had and things that I've done. And that That's way good. people can, you know, read it and, take a look at it, ask questions. And if it can help in any way, great. And it'll also maybe help people know that I'm ready to do them as well. But that and actually would be, sorry to interrupt Steve, but that would be an interesting way to go after it, Steve. Uh, and Mike, I think putting a couple hundred bucks behind it, targeting the audience pretty accurately on Facebook, you can dial that in. And so just let that ad be and be there, you know, learn about, you know, learn, learn exit strategies for property management companies. Well, and, you know, the, the ebook idea, and just to, you know, plug Alex a little bit, you know, I don't know if you're still doing those ebook creation, Heck yeah. seven of them that I did with you guys. And we use those as points of difference and, and we, we sell them in bundles and we also give them away. And I mean, talk about becoming the instant expert for leads on, on uh, just for clients. But if you did that for, for an ebook to sell, I mean that, you know, the ones that, that I did with you, Alex, those would be great to do as an ebook video, you know, the back end video and stuff like that. I mean, that'd be awesome. Yeah. And that's something I've been thinking about because when we've done all these talks over the last few years and really take those talks, take those PowerPoints and really put together good information for people to see. Um, and I think it would help a lot. The one thing that comes with that though, if it does work out well, you're going to get inundated with possible people with questions, which is great. I'm always happy to answer any questions, help anybody out anytime, but are you prepared to purchase? That's the other thing too, because it's not easy to purchase one, even one at a time it takes a lot of time and effort. You get multiple at a time, it, it can get a little crazy. So you want to make sure they work. So you almost need it. If you're going to go that heavy, you almost you need have a, team. a team. So you have to make the decision. It's going to be, because I do all the work on the acquisition side and then I have operational people to help, but uh, that would have to become a team if it gets, gets that large. And also what's your goal, right? What is my goal? Is my goal to try and get to 10, $20,000 dollars? Answer is no. So <laughs> it's not to be that big, but it is to be a good sized company and maybe have an exit somewhere down the road as well. Mm. Gotcha. All right. So we've uh, we've talked about valuations. We've talked. We gave people enough juice to kind of keep keep them listening. We've talked about uh, you know getting finding the deal flow. Talked about you know being choosy and and how to evaluate it to some extent. There's really so much to do. So all of you folks listening, just wait out for the book, right? The book will come out. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. good stuff there, I'm sure. It's just not, no resources out there for acquisitions. And it is just, it changes too. I mean, I think your ebook will be good for maybe like four months. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it too is like, you know, we were talking that, you know, the, the, the integration on the backside, you know, eventually the, the, the oceans have to collide at some point. You know, you, 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 you got to start, you know, I mean, even if you kept it separate, there's still banking and there, you know, I mean, there's, uh, yeah. there's economies of scale. So let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mike, go ahead. I would say volume one and volume two. That's what you'll end up having, right? There, it's an endless, like you can do a series on these things, become an expert and, and truly get the, the deal flow. But yeah, so, so Steve, you, perfect uh, segue actually. Um, Cause I think that's the last thing I want to talk about is the integration. This is, I'm on very unclear like let's say four and a half buys a company, another marketing company, you know, the value that we've gotten here is the, is the momentum and is the understanding is the depth of what we've learned and how we execute. I'm not sure how I would feel about having another company doing things their own way, but being part of us, you know what I'm saying? So how do you do that, Mike? Well, it depends, right? So there's multiple ways to do it. Um, 
one new strategy that I've been putting together that has worked really well is I don't really change almost anything, right? I get my broker's side set up. I get, I, I do have my own accounting side where I have the accounting is offsite. So that is integrated no matter what. Um, that's almost no choice because that's a main part of my business. And I think something that helps me flow the company more easily. But the last two, I, I did not make any changes hardly at all. I, I mean, I didn't change the pricing for the client. Better. I didn't, I mean, I did nothing to really disrupt anything in there. I let it, I made sure it was running smoothly. I made sure the employees that I kept were happy. I made sure the clients were happy. And then once that point, I got to that point where I said, hey, everything's feeling very comfortable. Then I started adding some new things. I started, you know, getting the new website in. I started, you know, giving some new contracts or new aspects of the contract that I wanted to change. Uh, so all of those type of things, I just moved in slowly. And the last two were 100%. We kept 100% retention on those last two, which I've never had before. Usually it's 10%, maybe a little less. I've heard 15%. So that's one strategy to not do a whole lot. And, and you really not be so inclined to push. We're all type A personalities, right? Most people buying companies, we want to push what we want, right? And I learned that I got to take a step back, relax a little bit. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So that's one aspect. Now, if I'm buying a company that I'm not super comfortable with, or there's something about it that's bothering me, maybe they're operational, or maybe I'm not completely in, li uh, in line with the seller, I'll have a hard, hard contract stop with them. Like, this has to be done. We have to have this aligned properly. And I'm changing all the contracts for all the clients, and we'll have a clawback in place. It's more aggressive. But if that's the only way I feel I can do it, I will. So it really depends on how you're aligned with the, the buy, how the buyer and seller align, because that's the most important thing in any acquisition is teamwork between the buyer and seller. You have to be working with and for each other to make it work out well. And then you have to decide if you want to do the soft integration or the hardcore clawback, and this is how it's going to go. And I would imagine a lot of that has to do with how they've been operating prior. Like if they have a good 100%. operation, you're like, just let it ride. Why, they, why touch it? Don't, don't fix yeah. what's not broken, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So, Steve, with your tight operation, operational discipline, knowledge, and execution over the years, you've been, spent so much time dialing that in. How would you be able to be okay with not a company performing a different way, potentially carrying your name? Well, First, let's just clarify. It's really Pete that's created the, <laughs> the discipline and operation. Well, you we were there. Know, we all know that's not me, but um, you know, I, I think a part, of, a big part of what we do is is our systems and our streamlining. So, I honestly think our biggest point of difference is how we leverage and outsource with our virtual assistants. You know, we, we, the ones we have, you know, down in Mexico, and, and we have we've got such great. You know, Pete has created these online checklists that we've spent, uh, I'm gonna say, upwards of $80,000 creating these checklists. And they're, you know, these cloud-based systems that, that he's his baby that make it so integrated to operate in anywhere in the, in the country that the, the systemization we do, I think we'd almost need to, we'd let it run separately, but once we did that integration, I think we've got to bring it in because our integration works so well it makes things streamlined so much easier for any operation. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that, you that can make a, un, unscalable company scalable in a matter of like months, right. Rather than taking it years. And that, that's the advantage. So, and here's what I think the property management market right now for acquisitions is really good. You can buy a company and do nothing and still make money, right? You can do that and, and do it well, do it really well. Cause that company grows, right? We have this, the Sunburst got the websites, got the marketing. I mean, they're, Last time you told me that I'm like, they're getting, they're getting leads. They, you know, they've never gotten anything anywhere near that amount. Right. I mean, right. things are, things are happening, but on the other side, you can buy an under with, with the systems like Steve's, you can buy an underperforming company, pay a little bit more outbid others, knowing that you will systemize it on the back end to, to be the truly like the, you know, the scalable company you want it to be. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things, Alex, is the fact that, you know, in, in that situation, if it was underperforming, that's just a rip off the bandaid, I think, at some point, where you just got to rip it off. And, yep. you know, like uh, Mike and I were talking earlier, the, the answer may be, maybe we operate on the back end at first, and we do the transition on the back end, 
before anything's done and we start streamlining the operation side before we change the face of the front building. So we've done a lot of the infrastructure back end. doesn't mean we change pricing or anything, but it's just the, the structure and systemization that sure. we spent so much time creating that I think would, it, it, I mean, it actually makes things run smoother and systematically better in our opinion with our procedures and our policies. And it's, it's like you said, it's a scalable model it works in any state it works in it'll work in any country to be honest with you. But, but I think that you got to, my interpretation would be is we've got to look at it on a case by case basis. Like Mike said, if they're operating good, we're going to let it ride and we're going to slowly start changing the back end things that nobody would see or know about just to make things easier for the employees. You know, that just some of the stuff that we do works so well, especially with our virtual assistants and how we have that whole system set up down there. I mean, it, it, it it's a nice setup, you know, and it makes things, it'll make the operation run better which would our point of difference is we can run leaner bring our operating costs down to the 33 percent mark for for expenses as opposed to the 50 60 i was in sydney and i was talking to some guys and they were telling me they were in the 90 percent for employee expenses i was like how do you guys operate they said we do it all through sales sales drives us of course it was the most expensive city in, uh, uh office in, in sydney australia but you know they i mean they were half our size and their rent roll was more than ours just to give you an idea of how much money, but he said that's that, that's how overstaffed they are, and I'm thinking we can come in and streamline this thing so easily and quickly that we can make you guys a lot more profitable just by streamlining your operation. Doesn't mean you have to get rid of staff, but you can just make them run more operationally sound to to get them running, you know, to, for the growth and for whatever you're going to do. Mm. Yeah, and I think that you know the ripping off the banding of bandit approach could be detrimental to any purchases that you have as well because a seller does not want to lose those have a claw back in there and lose all the the, right. the profit right so yeah. they you lose 50 properties in a 300 uh door uh, purchase that hurts their bottom line so yeah. if you are going to do the rip off the band-aid approach you are going to lose some there's no question because this is when you give change to clients that's opportunity right for them to look elsewhere so it really just depends i really you have to look at each acquisition independently um, and I think that's what some of the issues will happen with some of these larger companies coming in and doing these purchases, the VC back, hedge fund back. They want to just come in and just steamroll. Yeah, steamroll, streamline. This is how we're doing it. And they're going to have a, a lot of attrition during that time. In the long run, it's going to work out because they're probably going to have a lot of acquisitions. But all, overall, the, the seller is going to possibly get hurt in the long run. Now, Mike, when you when you do that that purchase, is there just inside, is there like a a phone call, a, a like to, to the to the uh, to the owner, to the tenant. Like, how's that done to notify them? Yeah, so no phone call to the tenant, but there is a letter that's sent out to the tenant. Uh, the owners, we try to we work with the seller depending on how they want to do it. So we either have the seller make the phone call, uh, we do a phone call together, or I do the phone call on the own. Okay, right. So we try and keep it as personal as possible, and we also let them know in, in certain instances that there's not going to be any change. Right. You're not going to feel it. We still have all these employees in place. We still have some, uh, at least a familiar face mm -hmm. that you keep. That's a good employee that works really hard. And there. You want to keep them. The, we also put in place that the owner stays on board for a certain amount of hours yeah. per week, whether it's, Hey, we, you need to be available 15 hours a week. Anything over that I'll pay you hourly at this for this much time. And it starts to kind of taper off after a few months because you want that familiar face still there. And like I said, it's important for the seller too, because the seller wants you to get everyone and stay under contract. Everyone has a goal, yes. a vested interest. And that's it why work. it's so important to stay in line with each other. And if you work together in that way and the seller is willing to help you, you're going to keep more. So that's, there's different ways of doing it. We yeah. try and keep it as personal as possible. Um, even with the employees, take them out to lunch, show your face, yeah. you know, make sure that they know you're a real person. Show make sure vision. you're in line with their goals. You say, hey, when we grow, you will. Yep. And this is how I run the company. So all of those type of things are important to work together. But um, like I said, it really depends. Each one is different. Now, here's, a, here's a question. Do you ever do disc profiling? We do. For the one company I do, yes. So, did, so when you hire, do you give everyone a disc and make sure they're the right person, right seat? So I haven't done that on new acquisitions yet because I, I don't want to scare them away. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, guys, this is the next episode. I think we've done we've done enough here. I know I know Steve, uh, you're excited. I'm about to come see you guys, so we'll chat chit chit chat about that for sure. I'm very interested in whatever next you were gonna say. Okay. Yeah. But, but I think that we'll take that offline. This was an amazing show. Tell people how to contact you. So, Steve, you're looking at my companies, Houston. What area are you looking at my companies in? Uh, we're actually looking anywhere in Texas right now, and we, we actually are looking outside of Texas. So, obviously, Texas is easy because we know it. People know us. They know our operation. Um, but we are looking for anyone that is looking, you know, Midwest, Eastern, not the country of California because it's just too, too oh, tough. Oh, please. We, we just, you just come here, pay our taxes, and leave. That's um, right. That's so, right. So, Steve, how do people find you if they want to chat with you about acquisitions? And, by the way, I vouch for the operationalized – nature of his company and how well it's running and that's to Pete's um his partner Pete's uh efforts but but Steve how do people find you yeah well the they, can, uh, they can uh email me steve at empireindustriesllc.com they can find me on Facebook uh, I'm all over social media all that stuff so they can find me um they can go to our website empireindustriesllc.com uh, I'm pretty accessible so if somebody wants to talk send me a message um I'm definitely here we're definitely interested so anyone that is looking um, they want to chat. Uh, we, we are open to, to having that discussion and seeing if there's anything that, you know, is win-win for everyone. Got it. And Mike, how about you? What, where are you looking to, uh, to acquire and how would people find you? Because you're a private man. Well, I'm in California, so I'd like to stay in California, uh, even with all the regulations and the, the DRE coming after all the property management companies. But uh, currently in uh, Silicon Valley uh, is my main, one of my main offices, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Capitola area, also in Sacramento. Uh, I'd like to expand those more if there's anything available there, but I'll look at anything in California. And quite honestly, I'll look at any acquisition throughout the country because if it makes sense, I'll figure out a way. But uh, also to, to build on that, if anybody has any questions or if I can help in any way, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, there's always going to be a little disclaimer. If I help, I don't want to be held liable for any, anybody else's acquisitions, but I'm willing to help as much as possible. I've learned to put that disclaimer in there on all of them, just so you know. That's why I'm but, here. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so I'm willing to help in any way, whether you're a buyer or seller, I'm willing to chat and help and I don't charge for that. I'm free, free information, happy to chat about it. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, at mike at recproperties.net. You can find me there. You can find me uh, also uh, on social media. You can contact Alex. Alex knows how to find me. Yeah, uh, so I would. Definitely readily available. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. And uh, thank you for you uh, listeners out there. And we hope to see you on, on the next episode. All right. We'll see you guys. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate it.